Good afternoon and welcome to another InReach Field Experience webinar. I'm very excited today to have with us a, one of our Garmin ambassadors, Brody Levin. Before we get uh, into our, our talk with Brody, I just want a few uh, bullets to go over. One, the slides for today's webinar are available in the handout section of the GoToWebinar. Uh, also, as we say with each of our webinars, we are recording. So if you miss anything or you want to look back later, you can go to our YouTube channel or to our uh, Garmin support site for that. And uh, important detail, we're going to have a great talk with Brody this evening, but we're going to save some time at the end for people to ask Brody questions. Remember to uh, write those questions into the questions section of GoToWebinar, and, uh, and we will pick out uh, questions to ask Brody. So um, try and keep, keep track of that and bring it into the, into the GoToWebinar for everyone. So let's get started. Um, most of you know my name is Chip Noble. I'm the product manager here at Carmen. Introduce myself first, and, and then we'll, we'll have Brody. Um, and you see, I'm the one on the bottom, in case you were wondering, the goofy guy with the GPS devices strapped to my shoulder. Uh, Brody, uh, would you like to tell, uh, tell everyone a little bit about yourself as we get started here? Yeah, hi, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm really happy to see so many people joining. I think that's awesome, especially given the, the various time zones everyone's at. Maybe some of you are eating dinner while you're watching. I appreciate that. Um, my name is Brody Levin. I'm in my gear room in my house in Salt Lake City, Utah, where I've lived for 15 years. And I am a professional skier, mostly, but it's kind of more like professional adventurer. Um, I'm into a lot of different activities. Um, and I think kind of the cohesive thing that brings all the all the activities together is that they're all human powered. So I don't ride chairlifts or snowmobiles. Um, I don't take helicopters to go biking or you know snowmobiles to go skiing or whatever it is. I, everything I do is uh, using only my legs to get me there. So um, as much as I like to say I'm a professional skier, I'm more of like a professional walker because in order to ski down the mountain, I have to climb up the mountain. And as you may imagine, that takes just a little more time than the skiing down. So I do a lot more walking than I do skiing. Um, Chip, thanks for that slide change there. You'll see four different activities there. Those are like my four, I guess, primary things I like to do. Um, on the bottom left there, you have skiing, specifically steep skiing. Again, it's all human powered. I haven't ridden a chairlift for like a decade. Um, Although I am completely in support of ski areas because that's where I come from. I'm actually from um, Northeastern Ohio uh, where, you know, some of these activities are kind of possible, but not so much. Uh, I've come from the flatlands and um, after I moved to Salt Lake, I started to get more and more into the mountain activities. Uh, and uh, so that, that's bike packing where I pack all my camping stuff onto a bike and go for a ride. That's rock climbing of all types. Um, that's ice climbing, mountaineering, that's steep skiing, and that's a lot of trail running too. Um, and some of this trail running stretches into, you know, uh, 50, 100 mile runs as well, which we'd call ultra running, anything over a marathon distance. So I really just like to spend as much time outside as possible. I like to come back with stories to tell people uh, that they can, you know, kind of use to inspire themselves to get outside or challenge themselves in whatever way they see, whatever way they see fit. And specifically, if you're looking on the left of those two pictures right now, um, you'll see a picture of me. Uh, I guess you could call it skiing, but I'm not really skiing at all. I like to say that if you have skis attached to you somewhere on your body, you're skiing. Um, because frequently when I'm skiing, my skis are on my back or over my shoulder or whatever. Um, and this this type of skiing right here is, is real steep skiing, ski mountaineering. This is taken in Alaska where I made um, the first descent of an ice climbing route. Uh, that's a famous ice climbing route up there and no one had ever thought to ski it. And I went up there and I first climbed it and then I ski back down it. And uh, that's kind of what I like to do. I like to do these first descents, be the first person to climb and ski mountains all over the world. That's great, Brody. I have to ask you the, the picture with you on the, uh, the platform on the steep wall. Now, that was, uh, wh where was that located, this particular? Picture. Uh, that's in Zion National Park in southern Utah, which is kind of, I mean, you're familiar with it. It's like these classic giant sandstone walls. And this is a type of climbing called big wall climbing because they're big walls um, and specifically aid climbing where we're not using our fingers and feet to get ourselves up the wall, but we're uh, using the gear that we have to help us get up the wall. That's awesome. 
Well, one of the reasons that we're excited to have you here, and you, and you touched on a little bit with this photo, is to talk about the gear that you use when you're in the back country. Um, so I'd like, if you could, to share with our, our listeners a little bit about that gear uh, that you bring with you. And I'll, I'll jump to the next slide so you can take us through this. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, regardless of the circumstances in which I'm talking about gear, I honestly usually start um, with my inReach, and that's because it's something that comes with me everywhere I go all the time. Um, and that's that's the truth. I'm now a Garmin-sponsored athlete, but that ha ha excuse me, that hasn't always been the case. Um, and before that was the case, this was still coming with me everywhere. Um, and that is because uh, statistically, the more time I spend in the mountains, the more time I spend in avalanche terrain. Avalanches are what I consider my my largest hazard to myself um, and to my partners. Um, the more time I spend out there, the more likely something will happen. And I, I embrace that. I don't deny that. Um, and instead, I kind of continue with this professional development, so to speak, whether that's wilderness first aid uh, training or it's uh, avalanche safety training um, or it's guide courses that I take, anything like that to help me and my partner stay safe out there. And also because I more more likely than something happening to me or my partner, I'm going to be coming across someone else that's that's had something happen to them. So I always want to have um, an in reach with me, not only for the SOS button that you know so famous, um, but also for two-way communication, weather forecasts, and the what I use it for mostly is the navigation features that it has because it's pretty much a full functioning GPS. I don't carry a separate GPS with me. Um, when I'm packing for these trips, you can see these photos that I take. I actually pack this way partially um, because I have some part of me that really appreciates this. Um, and this this really helps me. I, I build these spreadsheets that I put together, um, and as I pack things, I lay them out so I can see them. And then before I put everything into duffel bags, I go through my spreadsheet um, and I cross it off, and I look at it, I find it, put it in a bag, cross it off, look at it, find it, put it in the bag, cross it off, and that allows me to make sure I have everything I need because when I'm out there, especially on expeditions, when I'm totally self-supported by myself, there's no option for someone to drop off some more food or some more fuel for my stove. Um, that's just not an option. And so I need to make sure I have everything I need, but nothing that I don't, because again, everything is usually being carried on my back or when I'm bike packing on my bike. Um, but I have to carry every ounce up there with me. And so I want to make sure I use the lightest weight gear, which is why I'm frequently using the InReach Mini instead of the uh, InReach Explorer Plus. And I also have gear that um, frequently can serve two purposes. I have a couple of highlighted pieces of gear I'm going to go through super quickly here. Um, because I always have an inReach with me, I also always have a phone with me, which is another safety device because I have all the apps on here. There's my dog. That's Her name's Spaghetti. Um, I have all the apps on here that I use for navigation. I have maps downloaded. Um, I usually don't have service when I'm in the mountains, but if so, I can obviously reach out to people. And I have my camera with me as well as all my Kindle books are on here um, and my music's on here as well. Because I have these electronic devices with me though, I also need to have something to charge them. And so I always carry at least one little goal zero charger that I can usually charge from a solar panel. Um, and depending on the length of the trip, uh, I'll get bigger and bigger ones to allow me to recharge more and more. Um, so just for a day trip, I always carry something like this that'll charge my phone at least once. Um, for an expedition, an extended expedition, I'll have more charging capabilities. And then um, safety is the most important thing for me and my partners when I'm out there. So I always have a first aid kit. I know exactly what's in here and I know exactly how to use everything that's in here. I don't just buy one of those pre pre-packaged first aid kits because it has a bunch of stuff that I don't know how to use that I haven't received training on. So instead I buy one of those and I pick a bunch of stuff out of it, make my own. This is super lightweight, super small, and it's something I'm always willing to carry. Whether I'm rock climbing, ice climbing, skiing, bike packing, this always comes with me. And there aren't exceptions to that. If I go out by myself, I could come across someone else who's had an accident, bring my first aid kit. If I come out with a partner, something happened to them, something could happen to me. So I always, always have this with me. In addition, I always have a puffy jacket that packs down real small. These are down puppies that um, I've used to save someone's life in the backcountry before because they were injured. They had a broken femur. They didn't have any way to get warm. They were wearing all cotton. I was able to pull this out as well as an emergency safe or space blanket that I keep in here. You can actually see it through there. Um, and between those two things, it helped help keep someone alive for sure. Um, and then in the current situation right now, I make sure to always have a mask with me, even in the backcountry as well. Again, in case you come across an injured person, um, or just for the end when you want to go get some food or whatever. Um, I always ski with the helmet. I always have some water, always have some food. 
Um, but it's, it's funny because pretty much everything I'm carrying with me, even my extra gloves and extra layers, it all comes down to safety, if you think about it. Because when I'm skiing, I've got my skis on my feet, my poles in my hands. That's all I really need. But I'm always carrying a backpack on my back with, you know, 15 pounds of gear in it just in case something happens because those things do happen and I want to make sure I have communication, the equipment to get myself out of these situations and the knowledge of how to use all of it. That's great. I, I really like the tip about making sure you know actually how to use all of the first aid equipment here, just carrying something that they may not be experienced with. I think that's really important for our listeners. Um, yeah, I have to it ask. It really came to me because, like, I, you know, we always carry avalanche equipment, as you know, the beacon, shovel, and probe, right? So beacon, so you can find someone, probe, so you can find them buried in an avalanche, and a shovel, so you can dig that person out of the avalanche. And we always stress that if you carry a beacon, shovel, probe, you're not safe. If you carry a beacon, shovel, probe, and know how to use it, you or your partner, more likely, is the one that's safe, right? And so I realize that also goes for all the first aid stuff, right? It's no good carrying one of these first aid kits if you don't have the training of how to use it. It's true. It's true. Can you help me? I see in your picture uh, there in the upper corner, you, you mentioned your your special uh, travel partner. And when we were talking earlier, you shared a story that I think our listeners would like to hear um, about Spaghetti's special uh, uh, adventure skills. What was what was that story? For? Oh, when I took her on the rock? Yeah. yeah so so Spaghetti, um, she was found on the streets of Vegas having been hit by a car and we were able to to adopt her and bring her on home. And we've had it for a couple of years now. And um, I was just on the Grand Canyon recently for a three week kayaking trip. And when I came back, um, my girlfriend met me with spaghetti in the desert on my drive back home of Southern Utah. And we, um, spaghetti's like, you know, she's 25 pounds. She's, she was found in a dumpster. So, you know, she's not the most athletic dog, but she's made it on the streets of Las Vegas. So I'm like, if she can do that, she can do anything. So we got her a little climbing rated dog harness and we took her um, to this, it's kind of like a cave where you you walk to the top of it and then you have a free hanging rappel um, that's like over a hundred feet tall to the bottom mm -hmm. of it. And free hanging meaning your feet aren't along the wall as you go down, but it's totally overhanging. So you're just coming down. Um, and Spaghetti kind of freaked out obviously because she's like a hundred feet off the ground, just hanging by the rope. And she's kind of like between my legs underneath me. And she would, she didn't like it too much. So then I had the thought, to just kind of make my my leg rigid and put my foot out and she's really small so she was able to fit all four paws on the top of my shoe and just standing on my shoe like you know all four paws it made her so much more comfortable and it was the cutest little bonding moment it was really special that's wonderful so your dog has uh, more climbing experience than most uh, most people so that's <laughs> that's pretty impressive um brody i'm gonna I'm going to step to the next slide. And so we were talking about the importance of backcountry safety. I think you touched on this on the on the previous slide. Can you tell us a little bit about these pictures and where you're located and, and anything you wanted to add about, uh, you know, the importance of backcountry safety in these kind of conditions? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I spend so much time in the backcountry and I think it's really easy to romanticize it. Um, and when you're doing that, I think it's easy to overlook the dangers associated with it. You know, I've had friends pass away in the mountains. Um, I've had a bunch of close calls myself. And I think regardless of the level of training or experience that you have, or whether you had a mentor or not, um, no one is immune to the risks of the backcountry. And I think that is a, a huge appeal for a lot of people. And that's what brings us to the backcountry because that, that, that risk that's involved is fun. The consequences are also very real. Both of these photos are actually taken um, on the island of Svalbard. It's an archipelago. It's the it's the northernmost inhabited land on Earth. Um, it's at 69 degrees north, I want to say, or 70 degrees north, um, up near the North Pole. It's it's crazy. We were here during the winter, so we had 24 hours of darkness, and then we got 40 minutes of more light every single day. Um, because we were in the transition from winter to spring and by the time we left a month later we had 24 hours of light it was crazy um but we were extremely extremely remote um only 2,000 people live on the entire entire island there are more polar bears and snowmobiles than there are people and um and you know we're eight hours from the from the one and only town on the whole island here and so nothing could go wrong if you look in that rightmost picture um, there's a streak of snow dropping from kind of the shoulder of the mountain uh, that's closest to the camera. 
Um, and I'm actually maybe a fifth of the way down in that, that streak of snow, that coulard, um, which is, so the, the, the POV, the point of view of, from me is on the left there. And on the right is the point of view from across the valley. And I, I was, this was the first descent. I was the first person to ever ski this thing. It got to like, you know, five feet wide. And it was so much fun. It was so steep. There was avalanche stages. There's all these things that make it really exciting. But at the same time, in the back of my mind, I've kept in mind the risk and the consequence associated with that. So in order to minimize the risk, because I can't minimize the consequences, um, but in order to minimize the risk, you know, I skied slowly. I skied safety. I talked through it with my buddy there, Bjarne. He had very recently, like a couple months earlier, lost his best friend in the mountains to an avalanche. Um, and he was out there and he was getting it. So we wanted to make sure that we were as safe as possible. And I just want to make sure that um, as much as we encourage people to get outside, uh, especially during COVID, to get outside and have a good time, that they're doing so safely. Um, they're seeking mentorship. They're seeking guides. They're doing all the reading they can um, because nothing comes without a price, I think. Nice. Well, well, you've segued nicely. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this particular your Kazakhstan trip and ski mountaineering? I think our listeners would uh, would definitely like to hear more. Yeah. This. Um, thanks. Yeah. This is a that photo is a sunrise. Um, the mountain that I'm on in that picture, I'm taking this picture actually, but the mountain that my friends Robin and Vitaly are on in this picture um, is in Kazakhstan. In the background is Kyrgyzstan to my right is Russia and behind me is China. I'm like right on the border of all these countries. Um, this mountain had been climbed before. It had never been skied before though. And uh, it's 19,000 feet. And um, we, we spent a month in Kazakhstan trying these two first descents, uh, one of which was the tallest in this one sub range. We got to the top of it like many people have before. We also skied down it. We were the first people to ever do that. Um, we came, we were, we were kind of on a high. We're like, wow, we're in Kazakhstan, we're nailing it. We, we drove 24 hours. We finally get here. Uh, we walked two days to the base of the mountain. You know, it's the biggest adventure already. And now we're just at the bottom of the mountain. Um, we climbed to 17,500 feet, so we're about 1,500 feet short of the summit. Um, and the, the type of snow we experienced, a wind slab, uh, is was dangerous in the situation that we were in there was kind of no way around it It was a huge planar surface and thus the avalanche danger um caused us to turn around we had flown across the world we had spent weeks getting here tons of money um a lot was on the line but we were unwilling to take that next step and i think turning around and the ability to turn around confidently um although you always have that you know what if because you know what you turn around you get down safely you're like well why didn't i just keep going i got down safely that's because you may have not gotten down safely if that was the case, um, if you chose to keep going. And so, uh, yeah, we turned around, we got to the bottom. We're like, good, we're safe. We just got to get, you know, we got to walk two days back to the trail. There's this guy with these horses. He's going to help us get our stuff or whatever. We'll use a satellite or actually we're just using inReach to, to call for our, our car to come back. 24 hour drive to come pick us up, turn around, 24 hour drive back. Um, we're walking across the glacier glacial moraine. Um, where the glacier kind of ends being ice and it just turns or ends being snow and just turns into to kind of ice with rocks on it, um, rocks kind of embedded in it. And then eventually it just kind of turns to gravel. Um, and it's hard to remember that you're on a dry glacier at that point. And we're walking through it. We're no longer even roped up because we're honestly just feel like we're walking on a trail. But what it is, it's, it's this much gravel on top of glacial ice, super smooth, obviously. Um, and my really good friend, Robin, who there's three of us in the bottom center of that photo. Uh, Robin is the third one in, in the back there. I'm in front breaking trail, and this is heading up to the, some of the mountains. There's Robin with the, the red jacket. We're, we're walking together. We've climbed and skied all over the world. We're kind of we're kind of bummed we had to turn around on this peak. And um, Robin slips on some of this gravel going down the, you know, a 10 foot hill on this. There's no trail, obviously, but going down a 10 foot hill on this glacier. He slips and he's like, oh man. And I turn around, I'm like, are you okay? And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he goes to push, push himself up and he looks at his hand and his hand is just, just torn open. Oh. And if you were at a ski resort, you'd go to ski patrol hut. Maybe they'd stitch you up, whatever, no big deal. We're a two day walk from the end of the road, which is a 24 hour drive from the nearest hospital. Um, and so quickly we go from like, oh, are you okay? Like, let's put some water on it to like, holy cow, this could get serious kind of quickly. Um, and before we did anything else, we just sent a message to a doctor friend using my inReach in the States. 
And I said, really briefly, here's what happened. I always have my inReach paired to my phone. So I actually just pulled my phone out of my chest pocket. I always have it there. My inReach is on my other strap. Um, pull it out of my chest pocket. I say, you know, Robin slipped and fell, his hands open. We have these antibiotics. We have these painkillers. Um, this is the situation. We've, we irri we've high pressure irrigated it using the syringe that I always have in here. Um, and just kind of explain the situation. And what went from nothing to kind of serious pretty quickly went back to kind of tampered our fear to being like, you guys are fine. Just walk to the road, wrap it up, put some compression, use an ACE bandage, um, get to the road, make sure it's clean, get to the hospital. When you guys get there, we'll talk then. And we were able to actually, I mean, he wasn't in a ton of pain or anything. So we were able to enjoy the rest of our trip. Of course, we had to add on this whole hospital element of it. Um, but we were able to know everything would be okay, according to a doctor that's a true friend back in the States. We get to the hospital in the capital of Kazakhstan, um, and we still have our inReach, and we're still texting on it the entire time. And um, the doctors are proposing pretty quick surgery. Um, they're proposing a, a couple of different things that we're just, we just want to check with our doctor friend in the States. Um, and long story short, we, we pretty much come to the conclusion that we disagree with what the, do the local doctors are proposing. We think we're better off getting home. Um, we'll take care of things there. We've confirmed with both the local doctors and our doctors at home that there's no further damage um, that we're risking. So let's just take care of this once we get home. Um, and just the ability to communicate like that, we had run out, you know, we didn't have cell service or we didn't, we didn't have cell phone, we didn't have Kazakhstan cell phones. Um, and so the ability to have that communication in Kazakhstan really provided us that extra level of comfort through the inReach that we wouldn't have otherwise had because we both have medical training, but you know, when you see a wide open hand, the difference between do we need to call for a helicopter and press the SOS button, or do we just need to wrap it up and get home quickly? There's a big difference there. Nice. That is one of the big points that we talk about with our with our inReach uh, users is that peace of mind. So you were in the back country and you were able to get some peace of mind about the level of severity of the injury and then even actually to get some follow-up information while you were uh, you know talking with the doctors local you were able to reach back home that's a, that's a great example of abusing the in reach uh, can you tell so me a little bit than that S oh sorry no no that's okay go ahead well it's just so much more than the sos button you know like we have rescue and evacuation insurance for example um we have travel insurance we could have just pressed SOS, been out of there, no money out of our pocket, not not been out of there, but we would have had a Kazakh military hospital helicopter take us to a Russian military helicopter, which would have gotten us home eventually. All of that said, I think it's easier to it's easy to sit at home and planning these trips, whether you're going for a weekend hike or an expedition across the world, and think, oh, I have this insurance, I have this device, everything's fine. But in reality, it's for me, it, it's not about pushing the SOS button. It's about that ability to to actually have live two-way conversations as if I was just texting on my phone at home and talk to that doctor friend and figure out like, hey, what do you recommend? I trust you as a friend and of course as a physician. That's right, that's right. Brody, can you touch a little bit? Um, we're looking at this slide with you guys uh, uh, doing some traverse here. Can you tell us a little bit about how you navigated when you were in the back country? Uh, what yeah, tools I mean, do you um, use for me? Because we're in slightly kind of a disputed territory right here, the, the newest maps we could we could find were from like the late 60s um, for this part of the country. And we had some local knowledge and people were giving us some tips, but we, we didn't have actual maps. And so I've got a bunch of different map apps downloaded on my phone. Um, and the one I always end up coming back to for me with my inReach is EarthMate um, because this Garmin app tends to be the most updated and relevant to the kind of adventures that I'm doing. Um, it shows me the information I need. I can obviously eliminate the layers I don't want to see or add the layers that I do want to see. Um, and there was no other way for us to navigate here. But this was taken at, I don't know, maybe three in the morning or something like that. Um, by the time the sun rose, we were in a complete whiteout. We call it being inside the ping pong ball. We can't, you know, we, we can't tell up from down pretty much. Um, and that's really nerve wracking when you're at probably 15,000 feet um, on a mountain on the other side of the world that no one's ever skied before. And who knows the last time anyone's ever even climbed it. Um, and so that extra level of comfort allows us to perform at a high level because when we're out there, we're not pushing ourselves to the very limit. 
when when you're across the world, you don't speak the language, you don't have a vehicle, you don't know anyone nearby, you don't have an emerg you don't have a you know solid emergency plan. Um, that's not the time to push the limit. We bring what we call our relative exposure, our relative danger down a notch when we're there because we have these other we have these other um, we have these other issues of exposure and other issues of risk that we don't have here in the in the backcountry of the Wasatch Mountains that I live at the base of. We have language barriers, we have communication, or we have travel and transportation issues. We have these other problems that we don't have at home. And so those actually heighten our risk. So in order to offset that, we lower the risks that we're taking physically. We don't push ourselves to the very limit. Um, and so having that peace of mind kind of helps lower some of those risks. Great, great. This, this last picture, this was um, the, the uh, I guess just before you guys had to turn around, it's a, with the avalanche conditions. Uh, yeah, this was um, this was getting to camp partway up the ridge the night before that that sunrise shot was taken. It had, it snowed that whole day getting to camp. Camp. There's like a maybe a 7,000 foot drop right on the other side of those rocks, right beside Robin there. Um, not vertical, but you know, very very steep. I mean, you, um, you wouldn't want to fall down there. And so, it snowed that whole night. Um, we woke up, we had a little bit of clear, and then we snowed more. So we, we really had to use that navigation and um, and being comfortable with GPS navigation. I don't know how to use the super fancy GPSs that Garmin even makes. And I don't know all those GPS features. I know how to do what's applicable to me. And for me, that's like very basic navigation using inReach and using the Garmin suite of apps that pair with the inReach. Um, and I, I'm pulling my phone because I'm, I'm doing most of it on my phone. I'm pulling out of my pocket, constantly looking at it, keeping track. A lot of people have GPX files drawn that we think is the route we want to follow and being able to kind of constantly reference that while I'm climbing out of my chest pocket um, is something that, again, allows me to focus on the task at hand more than like, oh, I wonder where we are, because that, that takes away some of the mental energy that I need to use to get to where I'm trying to go. Thanks. Well, you mentioned at the beginning of our webinar that uh, along with skiing, you take part in a bunch of other activities. Thought it would be nice for our listeners to hear you talk a little bit about uh, some of your bike packing that you do. Can you can you share a little about this uh, your trip in Wyoming? I mean, I think probably so many people that are tuned in right now um, are cyclists, and it's such an approachable sport. Um, I, I wouldn't consider myself a cyclist, you know, like. I don't go to the grocery store wearing spandex and I don't have a $17,000 bike that a lot of these guys tend to have guys and ladies. But um, what I do have is like this thirst for adventure and an inexpensive bike um, and the ability to navigate. And, uh, and so I like to do this sport called bike packing. For me, it started um, in 2010 when I graduated from college here in Salt Lake, I rode my bike across the country in what we call bike touring fashion. Um, I don't know if we have a photo of it, but um, it, it just rode on roads across the country. I had like a gas station map. I had bought my first inReach um, and I made my way across the country that way. And ever since then, I've liked to use my bike, um, not only as a means of transportation around town, but I like to use it as a means to an end and that end of being adventure. Uh, in Wyoming, we, I, I like I, this is my buddy Robin, the one who slipped and fell on his hand in Kazakhstan. It had been a couple of years since we had an adventure together. And we're like, let's go bike packing. And we um, we bought a paper map and uh, we sat there and we tried to link up four wheel drive trails to connect the Teton Mountains behind us in that photo of the left. That's the Grand Teton right over my left shoulder um, to the Wind River Mountains, which are in central Wyoming, I guess, um, to the east and then back to the Tetons. And um, there wasn't like a bike packing route that we had found. That was the sensor adventure we were looking for. Because we were just riding bikes on trails. That's not that adventurous. What was adventurous was trying to put this loop together, see how long it might take us, how much food we might need. We had a really short window of time. I think Robin had like a three day weekend. Um, anyway, so we put that route together and um, yeah, we got to use these like, you know, bike packing is really just camping by bike. So you have the same lightweight camping gear you'd always have. You see on the right side there. I mean, there's almost no bike specific gear. There's my helmet. There's, um, I don't even have bike shoes. I'm just wearing regular like hiking boots, hiking shoes. Um, and all of that stuff on the right fits into those four bags on the left, minus my dog spaghetti. Um, 
And you can see I've got an inReach Mini there right above a little water filter in order to charge those two things. I've got a little Goal Zero solar panel that goes right, uh, right on my handlebar bag, which is the big gray bag or the big uh, tan bag there. Um, and it's just a fun way to go camping. You can cover a little more ground than you could on foot. Um, and you, in, this, in this case, we were able to see two mountain ranges. Uh, what kind of happened though, is that it turns out a lot of these four wheel drive trails on this outdated map that we had um, weren't, weren't period. Um, and so we had, uh, yeah, we had a lot of mosquitoes, but we also had a lot of just non-existent trails pretty much where there may have like on the left there, like it's like maybe there used to be a trail here. It was never a, a, a four wheel drive like Jeep trail. Maybe it used to be a walking trail, but we ended up pushing our bikes for a good portion of it. Um, and again, that was like, we weren't disappointed. We're like, this is the adventure we were looking for. You know, on the right there, that valley is, I don't know, 20 miles long, a few miles across. And we just had a map saying we have to get the other end, other end of it. And it's not just like walking on grass when there's no trail. It's like walking in, you know, thickets and sagebrush and stuff that's like very hard to travel in. And then on top of that, my chain kept breaking. And so every time that happened, um, I was able to take a link out of my bike chain. And finally, I got on my inReach Mini and I texted someone who actually knows about biking, because I don't. And I'm like, hey, so my chain keeps breaking. And I take the bad link out of the chain. Why does it break again after I've taken the bad link out? And that's when I learned, because uh, that's how chains work. They get shorter, they get worse, they're more susceptible to breaking. And that's why the chain's a certain length. So I made the chain like this much shorter by the time I was done. I could only ride my bike in one gear, which is not what you want to do when you have like, I don't know, probably 30 pounds of camping gear attached to your 40 pound bike. Um, but uh, I was able to eventually push my bike uphill. Uh, we had a 9,000 foot pass on the road that we had to go over and I had to push my bike because like if I put that like that pressure on your pedals that you put on when you're climbing, my chain would just snap and I knew I had a long straightaway after that. So anyways, it was really nice to be able to ask, uh, how do I fix a chain or, you know, how do I deal with this when I know how to fix a chain, but it's not really working? That's good. So you, so you actually had bike maintenance by inReach, a little bit of um, tech support. Yeah, I've had kind of everything by inReach, to be honest. <laughs> That's good. Um, Oh, so so one of the other uh, activities that you shared with us was uh, was this great trip on the Grand Canyon, uh, and uh, you've, you've mentioned that you're not you say you're you say you're not much of a kayaker, but but I think we're going to see some pictures that claim otherwise. Uh, it would be great if you I, shared with us about this trip. Um, I I think a lot of people tuned in right now have probably been to the Grand Canyon. I had not. I've traveled to six different continents. I've done a lot of hiking, skiing, climbing all over the world, but, and I live, what, 12 hours from the Grand Canyon or something like that? Um, and I had never been there. And I wanted to change that. And the, the two things that have always attracted me to the Grand Canyon are something called the Rim to Rim to Rim, which is kind of what it sounds like. It's a trail that goes from one rim down to the river, you cross the river on one of two bridges that exist over the length of the Colorado River and the Grand Canyon. You go up to the other side, that's rim to rim, and then you turn around and come back to where you started. It's like a you know a couple of days hiking. Um, the the FKT, the fastest known time for runners, is less than seven hours on it. Um, I'm not much of a runner or a kayaker really, but I decided if I was going to kayak down the river. Oh, I got an invitation let's go down the river and a raft. I said, that sounds really fun, but I have no idea how to row a raft. In 21 days, because that's how long it took, 21 days is a long time to like, for me to sit still. And I bet a lot of people can relate to that. Um, and when you're on a raft, if you're not doing the rowing, you kind of, I think it goes this way, I don't even know. Um, it is a lot of sitting still and I, I don't do well with that. And so I said, okay, if I'm gonna go down the Grand Canyon, I would love to kayak. I'm not very good at kayaking. Um, I had a, I started <laughs> right before I rode my bike across the country in 2010. I started kayaking, whitewater kayaking briefly. I learned how to do the roll, you know, to get myself upright. Um, I did some small creeks in Utah and Montana and spent a summer whitewater kayaking. Um, 
and then the next year I had a couple of really close calls and finally one that just kind of, I'm like, I quit. There's the saying in the outdoor world, something along the lines of like, there's a lot of cool ways to die and this is not one of them. And for me, that was the case with kayaking. I'm like, I understand I, I have a lot of risk associated with my job, with the skiing that I do um, and job and passion are kind of very interwoven for me. Um, there's a lot of risk there. Kayaking is really fun. I love it, but that's not how I want to die. And I felt closer to death kayaking than I ever had skiing or anything else. I got like held underwater. So I quit, quit, done, done. Um, fast forward 10 years, I get an invitation to go down the Grand Canyon with my sister and 13 other strangers for 21 days. And I'm like, all right, cool. I just can't do the raft thing. I'm going to bust out my old dusty kayak paddle, borrow a kayak from a friend and see what I got. Uh, it was beautiful. Um, but I, I knew if I was going to sit in a kayak for three weeks, I knew that I had to expel some energy before I started. And so the day before we put in for our three week raft slash kayak trip, everyone else was rafting. I was the only one kayaking. And so that kind of made me extra nervous. And I was like, this is all strangers. So I'm kind of like, hey, strangers, like we're in a Facebook group before the trip. I'm like, hey, nice to meet you guys. Just so you know, I am going to be kayaking. Also, just so you know, I kind of suck at it, but I should be pretty self-sufficient. If you see me flailing around in the water, please look for my kayak somewhere because it's probably really cold in the water and I'm probably gonna need that kayak for the next couple of weeks. Um, so I decided to do that rim to rim to rim run. I tracked it with an inReach mini. Um, I I did that in like 10 hours or something like that. I wanted to get rid of all the antsiness I had for kayaking and also all the energy I had that I knew I wouldn't be able to expend on the river because the river has really sharp walls and it's not, it's not like you can go hiking or running every single day. Sometimes you're camping where there's the river and a cliff and you're camping right on the corner of it. Um, so I did the rim to rim to rim run and then I had three weeks sitting in a kayak. I did a lot of swimming next to my kayak on accident. Um, but I did make it down the river and um, I brought these two devices with me. I don't usually bring an InReach Explorer Plus and an InReach Mini. What was different about this trip is that I was in a group of 15 people whom I didn't know, whom are not used to going on big expeditions, let alone being away for three weeks, whom many of whom I learned um, had never been away from their significant other for more than a day ever. Um, there was a 65 year old guy, a 60 year old on our trip. He turned 60 in the first couple of weeks of our trip. Um, and he was freshly married and he said that he had never gone more than 12 hours without talking to his wife of like a few years. And he was pretty worried about that and rightfully so because we were gonna be in a risky environment. We, it was winter in the Grand Canyon, which is not always warm like you may expect. The water hovers around 40 degrees. Um, there's big rapids of course uh, with a bunch of strangers. Um, and so when I said, hey guys, the InReach Mini is gonna be for me, I'm gonna do all my texting with this. I'm gonna do weather updates with this. This inReach is going to be sitting on top of the solar or the battery station, which you see in that bottom center picture. I had two Goal Zero Yeti 500Xs um, with 200 watts of solar panels, which is a lot of solar power because the canyon is so narrow and we were there in the winter when the sun is really low. So we were sometimes only getting like 20 to 40 minutes of direct sun every day. And sometimes our camp wasn't getting any sun depending where we were in the river. So when we did get sun, if we got to camp early or something like that, I would set up these solar panels, start charging. Um, and I would always have this out and everyone could pair this to their phone, um, use the inReach to send their message and then they'd pass it to someone else. And they say, hey, I wanna get in touch with your wife or your, your boyfriend or whoever it is. And this thing would just go around the campfire. And it was really cool to see folks um, all decide to engage with it on their own level. Chip, something I found interesting, I thought it was gonna be, we had a huge, we had people from I think 24 to 60. Um, and it was pretty spaced evenly with the ages in there. And I thought it was gonna be like all the millennials reaching for this thing as soon as we got to camp. It turns out many of the millennials went three weeks maybe sending a text per week, hey, I'm alive or whatever it is, because they wanted to, detach. They were so sick of Zoom meetings and stuff. They were like, I want to get away from this stuff. That's why I'm going in the Grand Canyon for three weeks. Meanwhile, the other, the older generation, as soon as we got to camp, they're like, hey, Brody, could you unpack that inReach? I got to send a text real quick. 
And then an hour later, they're like, sorry, I sent 27, you know, but they were just so into it. Yes. I found that really interesting actually, because they were, um, while this piece of technology is not something they had, they were so fascinated by it. The fact that they could have communication there that they took advantage of it. But what I also didn't expect, I thought this was gonna be the group in reach. As it turns out, you can kind of see in that bottom picture there, there was like six other in reaches among our group of 15. It turns out everyone owns one of these. And some people were being, you know, one guy's like, hey, I bought this before the trip. He had an in reach many. He's like, I bought this before the trip for weather forecasts. Because when you're on day 18 in the Grand Canyon, you haven't gotten any updated weather. Well, the weather, of course, impacts the rain. The rain impacts the flow of the river and how many CFS, cubic feet per second, the river is flowing, impacts yeah. where you can camp, where the boats are going to get washed away, and of course, the size of the rapids. And so he brought his inReach Mini for the weather forecast. Someone else brought their inReach just to text their boyfriend. And someone else bought their inReach because they wanted to have kind of that satellite view of where we were moving along the river each day. And they could send the breadcrumb out through a map, the breadcrumb trail out through MapShare, and they were able to share that with their family back home. That's great. Yeah, definitely lots of uh, different features for, uh, for inReach that, uh, that will help with a trip like that. Uh, Brody, a quick question. I have to ask you the red container in the, uh, in the lower picture there. Um, what you've, you've actually shared with me, but our listeners may be wondering what exactly that is. So part of going on the Grand Canyon is um, pooping. And when you're 21 days in, uh, you have, you, you're still pooping, obviously. And um, we, the Grand Canyon has an excellent leave no trace ethic associated with it. These camps that are along the river every few miles get used every day year round. And you walk to these camp, these sandy beaches, and I would like look for micro trash, micro plastics, anything small to pick up so I could, you know, take it out with me. There is nothing. People leave these camps spotless. And I think it's something for other national parks, uh, BLM land areas all over the world to aspire to, because the Grand Canyon is honestly like a shining example of a leave no trace ethic. Um, and with that is the bathroom. Um, you only pee in moving water. You don't even pee in the desert. You only pee like in the flow of the river. Um, and all the poop has to be carried out. So these things are called ammo cans, which are ammunition cans. They're like, uh, here's a shoe box. It's maybe like a shoe box and a half wide and maybe 16 inches tall or something like that. Um, and they're called groovers because when you sit on them, the edge of the open shoe box may or may not leave grooves in your butt. But these days, the other kind of butt, one T, these days we actually put a toilet seat like you see on that other uh, groover right there. Um, and yeah, you do your business in there. And then each day the groover duty rotates. And so it's like, hey, Chip, it's, you know, the third day. That means it's your rotation for groover duty. So you get to That's set right. it up, you get to clean it up, and you get to pack it up. Nice. Well, that was a that was a new term for me, the Gruber, when you shared that with us. So I thought that would be that's an exciting uh, detail for people. We're ready now. The next time we hear someone say you're on Gruber duty, we know what that implies. You know, I've um, heard in some trips though, if you're the one who volunteers to be, because we have different duties, we have cooking duty, fire duty, Gruber duty, and you rotate each day. Yeah. I've had multiple friends before their trip say, hey. I volunteer for Groover duty every single day, which is kind of fun because you get to set it up in the most scenic places. Most of these campsites have like a designated Groover spot where you're like looking at the river and it's like the most glorious throne ever. Well, yeah. frequently if you volunteer for everyday Groover duty, you get out of ever having to cook, ever having to do fire, ever having to clean up. So it's like, yeah, it's kind of a toss up actually. Maybe, maybe worth it. Brody, I jumped to the, to the, uh, Whoop, here to this picture. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, other activities and, and in particular um, to tie in with our inReach? How did you arrange uh, for your pickup at the end of the trip? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the most dangerous part of the Grand Canyon, of, of floating down the Grand Canyon, kayaking down the Grand Canyon, is not necessarily the rapids that you encounter, which are massive, unlike anything else in the lower 48. Like the, It's not that they're harder to, to kayak or raft through, but it's that they're just larger because there's so much water moving through this river. We don't have other rivers like that in the lower 48. Um, so a lot of them, they're, they're really, it's a really deep river because there's so much water moving through it. And that means, you know, in a kayak, when you're upside down and you suck at rolling like I do, you're not gonna hit your head on a rock, right? Like you're, you're it, it's safe, it's deep. 
um, because often the, the risk associated with white water is the shallowness of it because white water is often caused by rocks under the water. Well, um, there are so many side activities in the Grand Canyon, everything from bouldering to uh, jumping off cliffs that you see on the left, hiking that you see in the middle, and um, uh, canyoneering that you see on the right, uh, you know, frequently with ropes and harnesses to repel and stuff. This is, I think, where people frequently get hurt in the Grand Canyon. It's where we had our closest calls. And that's why I think having an inReach with you, not only when you're in the water, because you're not texting people when you're in the water, you're not lost either. There's only one way to go. Um, but when you start getting way off trail, you know, I would go for these 10, 12 mile runs when we got to camp sometimes. And I'd go down these trails and like all of a sudden I'm like, oh boy, like it's not just like this here. It's like a big plateau and I don't want to get lost. And so navigation was a really important part of it. Also, we didn't know if we were gonna take 19 days, 20 days, 21 days, which doesn't seem like a big deal, but when it comes to food and when it comes to being picked up at the end of the river, because contrary to popular belief, on a river trip, you don't end where you start. You end down river, it's not a loop. And so um, we had to get picked up in like the middle of nowhere, right? And in order to arrange those pickups, we had to use one of our 87 inReaches that we had with us. Very good. I have to ask you, uh, are there more kayaking trips in your future? I mean, I quit for good uh, 10 years ago. So <laughs> whatever that's for. This was, this was really fun. I had to buy a bunch of kayaking gear that I had sold, you know, 10 years ago. Well, yeah. I had a great time on this trip. At the same time, the day I got back home to Salt Lake, I listed all of the gear I had bought for sale on Craigslist. <laughs> there you go. Very good. Um, well, th I, I appreciate the, the uh, descriptions of those adventures, the adventures with your inReach. We want to save some time for some questions, but I also wanted to give it just a second for you to share some of the ways uh, with our listeners of how they can follow you on your adventures. Um, I, I follow all of these and it's, you, you make some great posts and, and updates. Um, maybe share a little bit about your your social media with uh, with our listeners. Yeah, thanks, Chip. Um, I, I mean, if I'm easy to find. If you're not finding me, that means I'm not doing my job very well and Garmin needs to hear about it. Um, I work with a number of good companies like Garmin and Goal Zero um, that allow me to go on adventures all over the world and come back with stories, whether they're told via social media, traditional media, podcasts, magazine articles, newspaper articles, videos, whatever it is. Um, I always come back with some some stuff that it's not always about like these big adventures around the world like this bottom left one is uh taken just a few minutes from my house when i started a long bike trip from my house carrying all my ski gear and i rode up to the pacific northwest to ski these volcanoes and then rolled rode home totally unsupported and like these kind of adventures um hopefully get people fired up to get out in their own backyard or take that expedition across the world whatever it is so on all the social medias at road 11 um road 11.com and that's right. Great. Well, before we start, uh, you know, move into some questions for Brody, just want to remind everybody some some links for us, the Garmin Explorer website for your inReach content. This this webinar is going to be on the support site, and then our Garmin blog is a great place to go to see details about our our ambassadors like Brody and our our uh, our inReach users and and stories that they have uh, to share. Uh, yeah, Dana's real quick, with us. Garmin blog yeah. has a really good um, blog entry. They they wrote in conjunction with me about backcountry safety that we just did. If you're a resort skier looking into getting it into the backcountry, um, the Garmin blog is currently a great place to start because there's a whole article just about that. Uh, and I know Dana's with us, so maybe Dana, you can share uh, some questions that have come in from our listeners uh, for Brody. Yes, um, so thank you, Brody, for joining us today. So we had some questions come in. Um, so we're going to try to get through a couple of these before we end for today. Question around other methods of communication. So Brody, do you, use, do you also carry and use two-way radios in any of your adventures? Um, yeah, thanks, Dana. Um, two-way radios were something I tried for one year. Um, there was a really interesting avalanche story from here in the Wasatch, and I say here because it's like out my window here, um, where 
there was an avalanche. The person who was in the avalanche was actually okay, but they were they were at the base of the mountain, and the, their partner on top um, didn't know that they were okay. And so that person was still exposed to danger, but they just they were so concerned about their friend that they decided to put themselves in additional danger by going down the mountain to find them. They didn't have cell service. And um, moral of that whole story that I got out of it was that if they had two-way radios, it could have kept this upper person out of danger by letting them know that the lower person was okay. And I that day that I heard that story at a, um, a snow and so, snow science workshop, snow safety workshop, um, I bought radios that day at the workshop. They were for sale in the waiting area. Um, I carried them for a year, and I realized that I need those so infrequently that in-reach to in-reach communication um, suffices for me. And um, I went on an expedition in 2018 to the country of Georgia, and it was the first time that I really relied on in-reach to in-reach communication. Um, I decided to, to, to make the first descent of this couloir, but I had to climb it first. A couloir is like a narrow strip of snow, um, like a chute, and um, my partner decided to stay in camp. And I said goodbye. You know, like we gave each other a big hug. I'm like, I don't know how this is going to go. It should go well, um, but let's see how it goes. But in the meantime, I'm going to leave you with this. I'm going to carry the little one up with me. I hooked them up for inReach to inReach communication, which it turns out is super easy. And I don't know what took me so long to figure this out. Um, and I, I kind of use those as radio, so to speak, because really all I had to do was send a message saying, okay, I I'm okay. The only time I do use uh, two-way radios is for shooting with photographers where it's like, a, okay, the sun just came out, drop now, drop now, drop now, um, because I have to go out photographers for photos like this one, which is in all the Garmin ads this year. Um, and so I do use them then. Um, and uh, on the Grand Canyon, we were also using inReach in -reach communication. We had a little search and rescue event when someone got lost hiking. Um, and we relied on a number of inReaches to be able to talk to each other while we did like a night mission to find these people that were lost. Okay. Um, next question. What are the contents of your first aid kit? Oh man, my first aid kit. Uh, that's a fun one. Thanks for asking. Uh, I actually did a whole Instagram post on this one. I think first, first aid kits are a very personal thing, like I said, because like, for example, I take these first wilderness first responder courses that are like, I, I don't know how many hours, 80 hour courses or something like that. And you get a certification. And even those the companies that put those on and the teachers that teach them won't tell you what to carry in your first aid kit because it's such a personal thing, knowing what you kind of latched onto, what you know how to use, and also what activities you're doing and what um what accidents you might encounter. You're not going to carry a full like doctor's kit with you. And so I actually adapt my kit throughout the year based on the activities that I'm doing. For example, when I'm skiing, I don't carry a splint with me because if you break an arm or whatever, you, we have so many long straight things while we're skiing, like skis and poles and sticks available to us that we can use those as splints. Um, however, when I'm doing other activities, like say rock climbing, where I'm often above tree line and I don't have skis with me, I will carry a splint in those cases. Um, and so I don't carry narcotics. I carry a mixture of acetaminophen and ibuprofen because those two things together are um, the recommended dosage for pain medication or the recommended uh, treatment for pain medication, you know, ace bandage, some gauze. I carry a mask in my, I carry two masks in my first aid kit now, one for me, one for an injured party. I also carry gloves in my first aid kit, high pressure syringe for irrigation, um, and then some triangle bandages, where if you haven't used triangle bandages, highly recommended. Okay. So what is a triangle bandage? It's like a big triangle that's bandaged. Um, it, it's like a very, very useful, it's pretty much like a bandana folded in half, right? And it can be used to uh, sling and swath a broken arm. It can be used to stop bleeding. Um, it can be used as to tie on a uh, splint onto a broken bone. Um, they're, they're just like kind of like big rags that weigh nothing that are extremely absorbent and um, a little bit stretchy too. And if you take pretty much any wilderness first aid course, you will learn that triangle bandages are the jam. They also call them something else besides triangle bandages. Couldn't tell you okay. what that is. Um, so next question. So you do a lot of, obviously, a lot of skiing and backcountry activities. You use your phone, you use your inReach. Um, what are your thoughts on gloves and how do you manage, you know, keeping your hands warm and safe, but also messaging? Well, oh, interesting. I, I, I thought the question was going to end with what are your thoughts on gloves? And I'm like, <laughs> Yep, always wear them. Um, 
I, I actually, when I'm in the backcountry, I'm very, very weight conscious. Um, you know, I cut the tags off my stuff. I, I repackage my food into smaller bags. But at the same time, I always have three pairs of gloves with me. Um, a really thin pair for going uphill. Frequently, the really thin gloves are compatible with uh, devices. More and more these days, they're starting to have the little device thing. You know what? These suck. They never really work. I pretty much always end up taking my gloves off. Um, because you're, you know, they're never like that tight on your finger and, you know, you have to be kind of nimble with your fingers to use your phone. Um, and so if, if I'm in such cold weather that I can't take my gloves off to use my phone, I just type on the inReach. I've used these things long enough that it's not that bad to like go through the alphabet and like type like it's a cell phone in 1999, you know, it's like, it's really, really not that bad. Um, and so I just do that. But frequently, I have those thin gloves for going uphill. I have kind of my standard gloves that I'll wear um, going downhill or if it's a little bit colder going uphill. And then I have like an emergency pair of gloves that's pretty warm that I always have with me and to wear when it's cold. Um, I, I don't like to use my phone that much when I'm outside. And so I, uh, yeah, I just take my take my hands out. I mean, I probably take my hands out of my gloves, you know, 100 times while I'm skiing. Half the time while I'm going uphill in the backcountry, I'm not wearing gloves because that's the easiest way to regulate my temperature. Um, and if my temperature is regulated, I'm the most efficient in the backcountry. If I don't like the feeling of sweat and stuff. So if you can keep your temperature regulated, it's the easiest way to keep yourself moving in the backcountry. And moving is safe. Um, and the quickest way to regulate temperature is with a hood on and off throughout the day because you can dump so much heat just by taking your hood off and then keep so much heat in by putting it on. And the second way I regulate temperature is just taking my gloves off. And if I'm wearing a backpack, while I'm skiing, which I literally always am because I always ski in the backcountry, when I take my gloves off, I just use the little hook that all gloves have on them, and I just put them right here, and they hang right here while I'm hiking. And by doing that, I um, it's like I don't even have to stop walking. Like I'm hot, I take my gloves off, I'm still walking, still walking. I just hook them together, still walking, still talking to my friend behind me on the skin track. I put them like this. And I've just regulated my temperature a ton. So they come on and off all the time. And I don't find it too inconvenient to be using my cell phone or anything like that. Um, so the next question is, how does somebody go about finding a mentor? Like if they want to get into these backcountry activities, any recommendations? Yeah, I think mentorship in you know, outdoor activities, really mentorship in anything, but mentorship in outdoors activities is um, really important because so much is on the line with so many of the, these activities. You know, even like a, a weekend hike or an evening hike can turn into like a very high consequence situation um, if things don't go your way. Um, and so I think mentorship is pe something people value really highly. I was not fortunate enough to find a mentor. Um, I didn't know how I asked the same question. And finally, I decided to um, ask the one skier who I thought uh, someone I really looked up to. And I, I asked him to coffee and we met up for coffee and I asked him, um, can we would you know pretty much would you be my mentor and he pretty much said no um and i'm like okay noted uh that's not how you find a mentor always since then has that happened people doing that to me and it's worked perfectly fine and i say yes absolutely that is one way to do it but if you don't know that go-to person um the internet is a great place to kind of expand your network in any certain activities you know you look in the facebook groups but more than that kind of stuff because you don't know who you're finding then it's really easy to find out about find out about events and organizations and uh, like get-togethers. And through these events, like in backcountry skiing, I always tell people to donate to their local avalanche forecast center and then go to the big fundraising events, go to the annual galas or whatever, because that is a great place to meet people that are also serious about it. And whether you meet a ski partner or a climbing partner who's on your level and wants to learn alongside you, or you meet that mentor who's this you know, older man or woman who's been doing it forever and they're starting to slow down and they want to like share their knowledge with someone else. Those are really good ways to meet people. Other ways um, to find partners or mentors who can also be this often be the same thing is to look on like, uh, there's a lot of bulletin boards at gear shops, you know, go to your local independently run gear shop or REI or whatever. And they'll often have little peg boards out front where you can, you know, say looking for a climbing mentor. In climbing, you can go to the climbing gyms, they have the same partner boards. Um, and yeah, there's also just so many other ways to learn beyond mentorship. Uh, mentorship's a great way to gain experience because you can go out with someone who can help you stay safe. But at the same time, there's tons of online, you know, I, I teach a course um, 
a, an online based course through this company called Crux Academy that's just on adventure trip planning. And whether you're training, planning like a week long hike or a, a day rock climb or a month long expedition or a year long trip around the world, you can take this course online to learn that element of adventure trip planning. And so there's so many different ways to get into it. Um, I just recommend that you really kind of commit to it, jump in with two feet and whatever it is that you wanna learn, you, you really do dedicate yourself to it because I think that's the best way to stay safe and make sure you're having a good time doing it. So that's all that we have time for tonight. Um, we'll try to follow up with any, any more product related questions after the webinar. But yeah, thank you Brody so much for joining us and thank you Chip for, for hosting. Yes, thank you very much Brody, appreciate your time. Yeah, Dana, Chip, I really appreciate you guys uh, having me tonight and Katie behind the scenes. Um, I appreciate Garmin's support over the years and um, I, I just can't encourage everyone enough. These devices um, have really changed my experiences. They've also helped me develop my career because I'm more comfortable taking um, bigger trips because of them. Um, and so whether you're doing it for a living or just doing it for fun, uh, I really encourage you to stay safe out there and have fun. Awesome. Thank you very much, Brody. Thanks, everyone.